what Audrey is trying to contribute to you cannot be brought by Microsoft any more than it can be by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Taiwan or, for that matter, by Radical Exchange. It is an inter intersection of millions of organizations and billions of people to which each of us can only add a thread. So give Audrey a big round of applause. Thank you. Really happy to be here. Um, the clicker is not working, so I'll have to walk back in a minute uh, to, to take direct control of the keyboard. Uh, but let me just say that uh, please scan the QR code or enter slido.com and enter 01122. Uh, the pound sign is not necessary uh, to get into Slido and ask me questions and like each other's questions. Otherwise, this will be a very brief and boring presentation. So um, please do uh, ask me questions. So uh, I will start uh, with this uh, picture. This is the classical picture of a public administration. And uh, um, we have people caring about economy on one side and maybe environment sustainability on the other, or maybe innovation on one side and social justice on the other. And this is uh, what our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, referred to when she said her inauguration speech three and a half years ago. She said, before we think of democracy as a showdown between opposing values, but from now on, we must reimagine democracy to be conversation between diverse values. That is to say, instead of seeing those zero-sum games as something that we try to win and make the other side lose, we must have this instinct of seeing what a strange game. The only winning move is not to play and change the game. And we must change the game such that it enables people to contribute to common values despite different positions. And this is my office. This is literally my office for three years now. <laughs> so as digital minister, uh, I negotiated my turn uh, working with the government and not for the government. And by working with the government, I mean very specifically that location independence. Anywhere I work, I work. So Berlin is now my office. Uh, and voluntary association, every ministry join uh, this work of digital transformation by voluntarily sending one delegate so we have our foreign service delegate here and our ambassador here as well. Uh, and then um, the third is radical transparency. Anybody can find me here every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And there's no wall. We tore down the wall so people can walk directly into the social innovation lab from the street, from the park. It is actually part of a larger park. And then uh, just find me and talk for 40 minutes at a time. The only thing that I ask is that we publish everything we have talked about, either as a YouTube clip or as a transcript after 10 days of co-editing. And very interestingly, while the lobbyists and the people who speak with me uh, behind closed doors, if they had that chance, uh, would have lobbied for their private interest at the expense of the society or the environment, because I only accept meetings this way under radical transparency. Everybody talks about the global goals. Everybody talks about public good. And that is how mechanism design can change behavior of people. Uh, and this place is also a sandbox in which people bring their toys. Uh, these are self-driving tricycles. And self-driving tricycles are, are great. Uh, you will step on it, you tell it where to go, it very slowly drives through there. Uh, and because it's open software and open hardware, and because it's close to a flower market, the Jingle flower market, um, when we were doing the hackathon there, I remember an elderly couple just with some orchid flower in pots, uh, not that pot, but uh, in the pots of flowers, uh, and uh, walking by and saying, Minister, what are you doing with those shopping carts, with those baskets on trolleys? I'm like, these are not really shopping baskets. These are self-driving tricycles and essential places. And the elderly couple said, we don't want to be sent to places. We want these self-driving shopping baskets. They keep insisting that it's a shopping basket. Uh, follow me around so that I can shop hands-free, right? You, you get a pot of flour, you put into it, you walk, it walks with you. Once it's full, because they have heard on the television, on the radio, the self-driving car can form fleets. So maybe uh, they can summon another one, <laughs> and the empty one keeps closer to them, the full ones on the back. And so they can just, you know, walk the dog, uh, well, the self-driving tricycles, uh, along the flower market, and finally maybe step on one and, and it drives them home. And I'm like, these are not really designed to do that. But as with any good design, it's open source, it's open hardware, it's open data. And so the people around them, the Taipei tech people, challenge, see it as a challenge. 
And they actually did this redesign, the silver tri tricycles, to have two eyes so that they can follow people around, they can read people's emotions and hand gestures. In short, they responded to the social norm around what's expected of assistive intelligence or AIs uh, in a real interaction field. And the social norm uh, decides the market, it decides the market where it responds to it, and then the market uh, code decides then the architecture code of the software. Uh, and then that decides then the regulations and laws. And that is how things should be. If we do things in the top-down way where law decides the architecture of code that decides the market, that decides the social norm, people will feel very alienated from emerging technologies. And so the real um, question to ask here is that how can we encourage effective partnership? How can we design things so that these emerging technologies are solved uh, by the social sector side, owned by the social sector side, and elevated to the level of national policy? And so I will uh, use this one example, and then I will switch back to Slido to take your questions. Every year, Taiwan runs the presidential hackathon. We've been running it two years now. It's a national regulation. We must run it every year. Uh, and the hackathon, unlike other hackathons, which runs for maybe three days, uh, our hackathon runs for three months because it's presidential, you see. Uh, and every, <laughs> every April or so, we accept anyone uh, to propose any idea that uses data uh, to improve the, the common good. And they have to identify it with one of the 17 broad sustainable development goals. And then we look at those projects. And some of them are literally from the field. The water savior team from the last year saves water, hence water savior. Uh, and they, they were repairs people from the Taiwan Water Corporation who maintains the Taiwan's um, water pipelines. And it's one of the longest in the world, uh, maintained by the single company. Uh, and then in the Jilong region where they started, it used to take two months for a pipe leak to be detected by these people who listen to the pipe leaks. And most of their days are just churns, like listening to a pipe that are not leaking. And they say, what if we can use machine learning to build a chatbot that tells me where the pipe leaks are happening so I can spend most of my day uh, solving the issues instead of listening to pipes that are not leaking. And so we pair them uh, with a lot of people from the academia, from the private sector, from the public sector, and so on, and they form a data collaborative to fix that particular problem. Or, uh, for example, there was another team that was started from nurses from offshore islands, and the patients didn't trust them and keep insisting that they fly the patients to the main Taiwan island. And the helicopters are sometimes dangerous when flying at night, and one of them crashed. And after that, they say, what if we can just use telemedicine to connect to the doctors on the main Taiwan island, even though we know that it violates one law and five regulations, give me three months to prove that it actually provides value to the people in the uh, Green Island and then they took three months and it worked. Now, uh, we understand that there's many like-minded countries like Germany that runs very similar ideas like the prototype fund that encourage people to fail publicly, hence pivot, not failure. But the problem is that when they work, there is simply no political binding process that scales this to a national level. And the lack of the political will often just stops those innovations at the scale of a city or a town. So we designed our presidential hackathon so that every time the president has a trophy, which happens to look like the clean water and sanitation logo, uh, but with a micro projector behind it. So the down the bottom side is a micro projector when turned on, it projects a short film of the president herself handing the trophy to the team. So it's a very meta trophy, it describes itself. Uh, and then trophy carries the presidential promise of whatever people have prototyped in the pre previous three months is guaranteed to become national policy with all the regulation, budget, and personnel within the next 12 months. And so if their director general says, oh, Jilong is great for a pilot site, but we don't have the money to scale it to the country, you just summon the president and you have the money. Uh, or <laughs> if your minister of health says this requires a law change, we'll have to lobby the minister of interior uh, and, and send it to the MPs, it's too much of a hassle. You just summon the president and they go and have a meeting and present a draft bill amendment. And so that is the kind of political will we get. But now, uh, people might ask, those data collaboratives are great, but why would the MPs um, agree to change a law? There may be MPs from different parties, 
from different regions? Why, what, what is the, the magic that makes them agree on those uh, will, weird proposals that they may or may not understand that enable such data collaboratives? And it can be answered from two directions. It can be answered from the social sector and it can be answered from the public sector. From the social sector, that is because we always pair those top 20 teams in a presidential um, hackathon into data coalitions. This is Taiwan's one of the primary data coalitions. Uh, it's called the Airbox Community. All of these 2,000 or so dots are individuals that donate their balconies or primary school teachers using the Airbox, which is a very cheap, like less than 100 euros box, that measures the PM 2.5 and other air quality measurements and runs it to the distributed ledger uh, to make sure that people can hold each other accountable and together paint a picture of the real um, time air quality. Now, because the Ministry of Environment only had at that time 77 stations and the people has 2,000 stations and much closer to where people live, of course you're going to trust your neighbor's data and not the national data, and that gave them enormous bargaining power because the primary schoolers are, are learning data stewardship from those um, air boxes, and their parents really care about air quality as well. So they together argued and bargained uh, for, for example, you can see some uh, space around the, the, the top there. These are industrial parks, industrial areas, private property, and they cannot really break and enter and measure the air quality there. And they just said to the environmental agency, hey, we want you to install our air box, to join our distributed ledger, to be part of our data collision, hence forming a data collaborative, and to measure the air quality together. And in Taiwan, we always say we cannot beat them, we must join them. And and so because of this, the uh, EPA actually has to earn legitimacy by joining the social sector's data collision networks. And because it's open source and open hardware, it's also used as education tool around the world where people can just download. So the first answer to the legitimacy question is that if you pair it with the social sector data collision that has higher legitimacy than the government itself, then it has a much higher chance of getting support from the MPs. Now the next question is, okay, but why those top 20? Why those 20? instead of the other 85 or the other 90. There has to be a selection process. Well, we will use quadratic voting. In Taiwan, there is a uh, platform called join.gov.tw, join government Taiwan. Uh, that is our national participation platform. It has 10 million active users, and each one uh, identified uh, through SMS. And so basically, Taiwan has 23 uh, residents, 23 uh, population, so million population, and almost one half is on the participation platform, which is why we don't call it an e-participation platform anymore. We drop the e. It's just like, you know, our mail use something instead of saying email when over one half of population use it. It's at that stage. And so we ask all the 10 million people um, on the participation website to log in uh, to the presidential hackathon and look at a hundred or so projects and they have 99 points each and as you have already learned using 99 points you can like each of any of those um, ideas for example using computer vision and drones to detect marine debris and solve the plastic on the ocean problem that sounds good maybe that's your friend's project you get mobilized to vote for it but with 99 points the most you can do is vote nine votes which costs 81 points and you still have 18 left with 18 left, maybe you will see around and say, oh, there is a nice um, thing that fight communicable diseases by making sure that we use a distributed ledger, actually, to keep track of um, inoculation records of primary schoolers. That sounds cool. So maybe we will vote four votes. That costs 16, and you still have two points left. And maybe you then look all the way here and see that people from the airbox community are now doing water box, and they're measuring water pollutions on arable lands so that the Ministry of Economy can know who's, uh, which plant to cut electricity uh, and water supply because they have been polluting the, air, the eric um, lands. And that's evidently worth more than one vote. So maybe you take some of the votes back from here and vote for there. Actually, you'll discover these two have synergies, and maybe you do a seven and seven. 
and things like that. So in real time, we see people just reading up on those sustainable goals and figuring out the holistic connection between them. And with more than 200,000 uh, points spent uh, back and forth, back and forth, we actually have very good palette of top 20 that takes care of a wide swath of uh, interesting social issues, environmental issues to solve in Taiwan, and that all the MPs, all the different parties and so on, all have friends and families and political assistants that have participated in this process, and hence giving it popular legislation. Intimacy. And so when you go to the top 10 and make sure that all of this has delivered something tangible, when we go to the top five, when they get a presidential trophy, that is what convinces the ministers as well as the parliamentarians that if it requires a law change, this is what we should have given them because it's low hanging fruit that gives them instant political power really uh, to, to affirm the choice that is already made by quadratic voting. So this is just one small example of quadratic voting and to some degree data collision but that is how we've been using it uh, in our, our national politics. And so I'll stop here, uh, and this is the uh, look of my space, uh, the public digital innovation space in the Social Innovation Lab, and I tour around Taiwan to uh, the most rural, most indigenous offshore islands places and have a chat with people and connect with the five municipalities and all the 12 ministries, all section chief level or higher every other Tuesday or so, and anyone can summon me with 5,000 electronic signatures or any of the reverse mentors, people under 35 uh, working with each of the 12 ministers can also summon me and when I appear we do a zoom <laughs> conversation but it's like a fishbowl we have a conversation here and people in the five municipalities listen to us and they just solve the problem and start brainstorming issues uh, for the next presidential hackathon for the next sandbox uh, application and things like that based on the real demands on the ground by the people in the indigenous and rural and offshore islands and that is how we discover those new social innovations, not from Taipei, not from the capital city, but, but from where the social organizations and social organizers are. And so that's my presentation, and um, now we enter the Q&A. Uh, and as usual, uh, I say up front, anybody who raised their hand uh, wins priority uh, over the Slido questions on the screen um, to maximize inclusion. So any uh, people with any questions here in this room? Yes. Super cool, thank you. I, I'm just wondering how this could be implemented in other places. So like I'm American, for example, and so I'm always trying to think of ways to limit executive power. And so if there was something like this, and then there's a presidential decree, we have to enact it, and then there's, say, some laws that are violated with Congress, and then there's a battle between Congress and the president. I, I mean, I wouldn't certainly want to expand executive powers to in our current situation. So how do you deal with that in Taiwan? It's just five cases per year and they all agree with the sustainable goals. Um, th there is, a, a th we very carefully designed the number five. Uh, it is roughly speaking that um, each ministry will handle at most one related to them because there's 12 different social innovation related ministries. And so the five usually gets distributed to different ministries. So each minister only has to take on one case uh, outside of their original political mandate. Um, and, and defend it. And so we make sure that the minister or deputy minister is really involved in the final two months of the presidential hackathon. When we say data collaborative, we actually mean that each of the top 20 teams must have at least one senior public servant and one social sector person, activist, uh, social entrepreneur, and one person from the private sector, so that this idea, when it's being developed, makes sense to all of three sectors. And so if they cannot convince one another, if the public servant cannot really find a legal way, or the um, academic cannot find a way without violating physical law, uh, that, <laughs> that team does not get into the top five, because the jury is also made of, roughly speaking, all three sectors. And so we make sure that the top five really looks good on any of the party, any of the MPs portfolio of things to have supported. And this is a way to kind of just guarantee rough consensus, but on the national scale. And so we're very careful about that. We don't abuse uh, our executive power.
power, and we certainly won't say that we ran the entire top 20 through or the top 100 through. Uh, this is kind of a protocol between the executive and the parliament. And so we're certainly not saying that parliament has to accept it. It's just we choose the ones that are the least controversial and obviously the most working because it's been working for three months and every MP and every party is free to, to give it a taste during those three months and actually they do. And so we really cannot um, promise more than five every year. Uh, we track the progress of the other 15 in the top 20, but we only give the presidential mandate for the five. So, any question from the audience before I start taking another question? Other questions? Yes. Um, could you describe a little bit what is the political framework in Taiwan that enables uh, you a to to be working with government instead of um, in yeah for the government and and also that enabled such innovative ideas to, to have a space? Because I, I think there are many civic tech groups and movements that have been for the past um, almost 10 years trying to advocate for those ideas locally all over the world. I'm from Brazil. There was definitely a big movement there, but no political will. Uh, usually mo many of the participatory budgeting initiatives or which even uh, they, they started in, in Brazil, where I'm from, but you see it from Porto Alegre. Yeah, all over the world. And many times they're just taken as this kind of very superficial uh, marketing ish uh, initiative, but not there's no political will to implement it with this kind of depth. So if you can provide any insight from the history of Taiwan that can illuminate to us uh, what was it that, that enabled uh, these, these conditions. Excellent question, thank you. So there's a, a uh, more like uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago answer, and there's a, a like five years ago answer. And, and I will talk about the, the longer term one. Um, Taiwan only got our first presidential election uh, in the year 1996. So that's after the wild web. Taiwan only gets the freedom of speech and assembly in 1987-ish. Uh, that is to say, after personal computers. And that means that in Taiwan, there really is no legacy of paper-based representative democracy to defend. Uh, we started from a more or less blank state. And when we finally have the presidential election, most social sector organizations already have at least 10 years of head start to gain legitimacy by community action and community organization. And so even to this day, uh, when the environmental activists running the air box say the environment is like this, the air quality is like this, and our EPAs is like that, people trust the social sector. And, and so that is the, the uh, configuration that we're starting with and the, the little legacy that we have, that is the presidential legitimacy is nothing compared to the social sector. So that's the, the far reason. The short term reason, uh, five years ago in 2014, we just occupied the parliament for, for three weeks uh, and it's called a sunflower movement. At the time, the MPs were refusing to deliberate substantially the cross strait service trade agreement or the CSSTA uh, because they, I don't know, think it's a domestic issue or it's a purely administrative branch issue or, or whatever other excuses. And so because the MPs were on strike, the people elected them just took their office and did their job for them. That was the legitimacy theory anyway. Uh, and with uh, more than half a million people on the street and many more online, uh, we had 20 super nodes, that's to say the 20 NGOs, each of them, as I said, more legitimate than any president. And the 20 NGOs each deliberated on one specific aspect of the CSSTA. One talked about telecommunication and 4G network, uh, and the <laughs> other ones talk about labor laws, about the environment, about human rights, and so on and so forth. And I was part of the team that helped them to broadcast whatever they have said to uh, make sure that clarity and humor travels faster than disinformation. And so for the three weeks, which is very nonviolent in the uh, parliamentary area, actually people converged on consensus and produced five demands. Uh, and the five demands are met uh, by the head of the parliament who took all the five demands and say the occupiers have won. And, and so that is a mass demonstration in the pure sense of demo, like showing that if you arrange the civic tech good enough, 
it can be like GovTech, but better than GovTech. You can get consensus out of the half a million people. And so at the end of that year, uh, the occupiers, the facilitators, um, the people who enable them like me, gets hired as reverse mentors by the cabinet. So I served for two years as a reverse mentor, as an understudy minister. And then when Dr. Tsai Ing-wen gets elected and form a new cabinet, I get re-recruited as the full minister. So I've been working um, with the government for five years now. And I think without such a large-scale demonstration, uh, the civil servants will still be living in fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But having participated in such large-scale demos, <laughs> they now know that uh, it can produce consensus in no time. And there's always an outside game. Like if the government doesn't do this, we can always reoccupy. So <laughs> that, that is, <laughs> that, that is the, the real reason uh, in the short term. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Cool. So maybe we take some slide questions because, you know, digital inclusion now. Oh, there's one question from there. So, yeah. so maybe one question from the audience and then we take slide questions. Hi, um, uh, my name is Xiaohu. I wanted to ask about the relationship uh, between Taiwan and China in terms of the, the political economy of technology. So I understand that, for example, Huawei uh, uses some certain, the government of China uses certain chips to spy on people in certain areas. So how, as a digital minister, do you balance this type of, uh, you know, technology and political economy question? Okay, thank you. As I said, one of the 20 NGOs at the time of the 2014 Occupy was to talk about whether opening up the service of telecommunication and what does it mean. And in 2014, the consensus of the people who occupied the parliament and people who visited them, half a million people, was that we need to do a systemic risk analysis and that people correctly pointed out that there is no such thing as a private company supplier, there's no such thing as a pure market player, because whenever the uh, PRC leadership wants, they can just replace leadership from any of their so-called companies uh, and become de facto state-owned. And this is, uh, of course, evidenced by Jack Ma, and I don't have to repeat uh, the, the string of replacements. Uh, and so that's the, that part. And the other part is that people were saying that if we create a path dependency, then it kind of just locks our technological trajectory, and we really don't want to do that. We want to instead, for example, to work with MediaTek, one of the premier uh, SOC uh, company that makes the phones on the periphery that can adapt to a international different telecom providers instead of getting locked into the 4G network. And the uh, interesting thing is because the head of parliament took the consensus as valid, as, as like citizen initiated, almost referendum-like. Um, then the National Security Council and National Communication Commission actually said what the occupier said was correct. We agree with their system risk analysis. And so starting from 2014, uh, Taiwan did not allow any PRC components in the 4G telecommunication network. Uh, core or periphery. Actually, starting now, uh, last week, uh, even the, the Huawei phones are banned, uh, but that's for another reason. But in any case, uh, the thing is that we made it, it very clear that it was what people wanted instead of what a handful of experts in the government wanted. So we did not even have a another um, substantial controversy when 5G rolls out, because that was already conclusively solved uh, five years ago. I hope that answered your question. Okay. So uh, Audrey, before you go on, the yes. one thing I just, it's Glenn. Yes. One thing I just wanted to ask is, I thought the stuff about AI-mediated consensus that you were doing was so fascinating yes. and very related to the themes that I was raising earlier yes. about how we can move beyond pure individual-based things yep. to group-based things. Yes. I would love if you could just spend a couple minutes at some point just yes. telling people about that. I was trying to segue into that to answer to the first question. So thank you for anticipating the next Tetris box, so to speak. Uh, so no, I was really um, trying to answer that with the police example. So thank you for prompting. Uh, so the question that's on top is, does radical transparency work for any kind of discussion? Is there a danger of discussing complex and or sensitive problems that might be hijacked and misused when presented to the people that do not fully understand the scope of the problem? Problem. And so um, this pertains to two things. One is the record keeping part, and one is the agenda setting part. I will show you the record keeping part because it's simpler. So um, 
as you can see, after I become the digital minister, I've talked with 4,700 people, uh, over 1,000 occasions, on to 100,000 speeches. Uh, and each of these uh, is not a summary. It is a really a full transcript. For example, a certain David Plouffe, uh, working for Uber at the time, uh, argues for environmental sustainability by carpooling, I think. Uh, anyway, and that was the, the entire transcript of the, the argument, and starting from the doorbell. Uh, and it's actually on 360 records, so it's also on YouTube. If you put on VR, you can relive the conversation that David Plouffe had with me. Uh, and so um, th my point here is that um, we can hyperlink whatever we're talking about, and the last word was that just know everything you send my way will be made public. Um, and so <laughs> that, <laughs> that was the record keeping part. Uh, and so it's very difficult to be taken out of context uh, because first the SEO is really good with this one. And so it's very easy to just search and stumble upon this page and you can just show context and people know the context where it's going. And so it empowers investigative journalists who can get the entire context and add their point of view versus people who just are after sound bites. It makes sure that the full context are actually easier to produce real quick clarifications out of this whole context because it's just copy and paste really, uh, and as opposed to just fragments of conversation. And so <laughs> I think it really uh, answers the, the part of the question that talks about the complex problems because complex problems are <coughs> hard to frame, this dialogue is actually the easiest way to frame that. So for people who understand um, you know, the jargons, they can just read the transcript. Otherwise, they can follow uh, the YouTube remix videos that are made by people specializing in infographics, uh, taking just this transcripts and putting some nice uh, graphics out of it and so on. It makes it very easy to remix and produce infographics that are um, actually reflecting the real frame rather than the uh, bits and pieces that is shared by the government. And so this is the complex part and the sensitive part. And this is very interesting because every part of the, uh, like in the original Uber debate, <coughs> try to frame things very differently, right? Uh, as I mentioned, David Plouffe tried to frame it as a environmental friendly, reducing total car exhaust, whatever uh, thing. And then the, of course the taxi drivers frame it as a way of about, you know, the labor rights, about uh, the, the control of the total amount of cars or whatever, <laughs> things like that. And so these are issues that are framed very differently by different uh, groups of people. And that is why we don't jump straight in into quadratic voting or any kind of decision making procedure, but rather go through a consensus making procedure. And we use uh, POLIS for that. POLIS um, is an AI power conversation tool. And what it does is that uh, this is a avatar. This is the real UberX conversation as it did 20 in 2015. And these are my friends and families. <laughs> and so basically it uses principal component analysis to dynamically group people into the most divisive uh, parts and the orthogonal second most divisive parts and did a dimensional reduction of the k-means cluster of people who feel similarly about each other's statements into this um, interactive game. Uh, and the visualization does two things. First, it let people see that their friends and family are all over the board. The, these are not nameless enemies with different ideology that must be trolled. Uh, they are your friends and family, you just didn't talk about Uber X over dinner, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that they see people's positions and indeed groups positions can change. This is not about the number of people. If a thousand people go here and vote exactly the same way, the size of the area of the group does not uh, increase. It's just one dot. If everybody vote the same way, they're the same place in this uh, multi-dimensional idea space. But rather, this measures the diversity, the, the diversity of that particular cluster, and they may merge and they may move closer. And so it lets people see that it's kind of dynamic structure of loyalties. And so always we begin by sharing data, open citizen data, private sector data, government data, and then we ask people to share for three weeks what do they feel about it. <laughs> all the different feelings, there's no right or wrong. Right? You may feel anxious, I may feel happy, it's all okay. And the feelings 
gradually colleagues and people start proposing ideas. But ideas, the best ideas are the ones that take care of most people's feelings, and I will show you how in a second. And then we take <coughs> those the most resonating ideas and just turn them into regulation. And that is how Uber is being uh, is actually now running in, in Taiwan. It's by this crowdsourced regulation. And so the user experience, very simple. You see one statement from your fellow citizen. You agree or you disagree. There's no reply button because as everybody knows, if you have a reply button, trolls win the day automatically. Uh, so there's no reply button, and there's no way to attack uh, any personal attacks, just like Slido. Uh, and then you agree, disagree, another statement appears. You move toward the people who feel like you. So it's all very uh, interactive and very game-like. And after this goes on for a while, you'll be prompted then to add your contribution to propose something more nuanced, more eclectic, that could win over the other group. Because we stay on the top, we only take the top 10 intergroup consensus, that is to say statements that resonates with the supermajority of all the groups into account when doing our face-to-face -face consultation that would uh, end up de determining the regulation for Uber. And so because of that, people still competed, but they competed on building the social structure that attracts the most numbers of people's feelings. So this is a real conversation we helped run in Bowling Green, Kentucky, uh, USA. Uh, and these are the five divisive issues. Each one will neatly split the community in half. Um, and we just table them. We, we don't even touch them. And if you read institutional media or indeed some social media, you will think this is all there it is in the political landscape. People just fight over ideologies that divide people into halves. And then on the left, however, these are the rough consensus. And actually, there's far more things that people agree with each other, most of the neighbors, on uh, most of the things, most of the time. In Bowling Green, Kentucky, pretty much everybody, whether they identify as Republican or Democrat, said that the arts are an important component of K-12. They had STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math, but people think there should be STEAM education adding art to it, because art shows the direction of STEM obviously. And so that is the, the most consensual uh, statement. It costs practically nothing. Everybody is for it. Nobody is against it. It will, any mayor implementing this just gets automatically maybe 1% uh, more chance to getting reelected. But why people don't, don't even think about putting this into the political agenda? Because it's not divisive. It, it doesn't get any media sound bites or things like that. But just a simple um, principle component analysis K-means clustering tool, it's not even deep learning, uh, can get people <laughs> into the mindscape that we are a polity after all. And there's this series of 10 or 20 things that we can just do together uh, without offending any of those um, ideologies. And so, so that is what we do. And because it's free, as in freedom, and also free as in beer, it costs nothing, uh, and you can change it very easily. Uh, and any section chief now in Taiwan can just launch this, because they know they don't have to get 500 moderators to fight the trolls. The people will moderate themselves. And after three or four weeks, they just go back and harvest the top consensus and to take it into the political agenda. Very simple. And so this is one of the best civic tech to become GovTech. And it's been used uh, not only in Taiwan and the US, but also Canada, Singapore, and uh, a few European parties, I'm told, Alternivet, and so on. And so that is, uh, I think, a perfect um, like first diamond, the, the discover and define tool uh, that would lead then to quadratic voting or funding, the second diamond, uh, the implementation and the delivery. So I hope that answered the um, hijack part of this question. So is it possible for outside teams to participate in the hackathon where the sustainable goals are global. So I guess if you are on Earth, you can participate in the hackathon. I don't know about International Space Station or the Mars. Um, we haven't had any applications. Uh, but if you uh, live in somewhere that ratify the sustainable development goals, which is everywhere on Earth, um, then of course, join our international track in the presidential hackathon. The international track uh, this year was won by Honduras, who did a 
open procurement analysis tool that brings climate change analysis and echo design to the very first beginning stage of the planning of public constructions instead of way late. And Malaysia, which built a tool uh, that analyzes cartels and possible collusions in public procurement. So if you have better ideas using data to improve the livelihood of the planet, feel free to join the next presidential hackathon in Taiwan. Um, and these are quick questions, so I'll just go through them quickly. Um, how do I handle decision fatigue for users during quadratic voting? Well, we implement a very long quadratic voting period. So like uh, a week or even two weeks. Um, two weeks, I think, is what we settled with. And so during that time, people uh, who don't know about that particular sustainable goal have plenty of time to read up on it, to have a conversation about it, and just to change their votes until the very minute, last minute. And all of this trajectory is also on GitHub. So if you want to analyze that, that would be awesome. Two people would like to know, how did the Taiwanese government come to embrace these innovative processes and technologies? So in Taiwan, as I said, there's very little legacy around. I think that's mostly the, the, the core reason. Another reason, as I said, is that the Occupy showed people that this is simply a more efficient and effective way to gather consensus. And finally, I would say that in Taiwan, uh, our political processes has always been around this kind of um, consensus. When we uh, bring out this idea that we should de define our KPIs using a consensus making method, it did not face as much pushback as in other um, Western countries, I think because it's not actually the same word. In Taiwan we say gong shi, which is, which is the Mandarin for consensus, but if you translate literally, it is just common understanding. And so it carries a notion of people mapping the issues, come to a common understanding that we can live with, and that's it. And so it's even more rough than rough consensus. It's like everybody can live with it kind of consensus. And there's simply no English words for that. Um, maybe very rough consensus, or maybe just common understanding. <laughs> and so because of that, when people use the English see the word consensus, people think of something you can sign your name on. And of course people are going to push back if you're trying to get that fine a consensus. But because we're just seeking shi, well, that is no problem at all. All right, uh, and I have 47 seconds. Uh, I see the subliminal note. Uh, okay, so I'll be quick. Um, so there's a presidential election coming up for Taiwan, January 11th. Do I think QB system will face any challenge if party shift happens? No. Uh, I, as I mentioned, work for five, uh, five years now uh, with uh, the civic tech and the gov tech uh, communities at a Lagrange point uh, between the movement and the government. And so because of that, I'm pretty sure that every presidential candidate and every party is actually agreeing on this open government thing and social innovation. And in fact, the main component I get from the civic tech people is that this direction is correct. You're just not pushing it fast enough. And so because of that, and across all parties, and so I think this is pretty safe. This is, uh, as I said, a common understanding uh, for the Taiwanese people. Yes, I'm funding these ideas, and how much depends on how much funding it needs. And so, for example, the telemedicine one that uh, calls for installation of high-speed, high-definition video conferencing hardware in more than one de uh, 100 points all around the different islands and indigenous areas in Taiwan um, is, uh, I think, on a total uh, amount of um, tens of million of euros. It's a very large budget, actually. And they happen to have some special budget for that, and they just divert it a little bit uh, to, to use it in this way that also empowers the local education and digital opportunity centers and so on. And I think that's the largest budget for any single team. But we don't set a cap or a minimum. We only pay the uh, teams to implement their budget as originally envisioned on the national scale. Um, thank you for uh, the, the best uh, comment, uh, I guess. Uh, and so the SMS voting is, is very simple. It's just a simple uh, ID check by the telecom, and telecom only answers a binary question of uh, whether this uh, user lives in the specified area, usually Taiwan, but you can also specify down to a municipality, and, and whether they are of legal age uh, to vote, and that's it, whether they are 18 years or older or more. And so they just answer one binary question of whether it satisfies criteria. The telephone companies that
Okay, we can keep going? Okay, I'll be faster, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, any projects from presidential hacks on our implement turn out to have unintended consequences or be devised or regretted? No, actually. We've been looking at 10 projects so far, and even the ones that are really stretching the technological capability and legal capability, the one that we're having the most um, a requirement for political investment is this one of this year, Target 16.4, combating illicit financial flow. Uh, it uses deep learning to look at all the public listed companies' uh, reported uh, numbers and text and use all the prose prosecution documents like Panama Papers prosecutions uh, for illicit shell companies and, and like uh, this kind of trades and predict uh, using a uh, supervised learning model uh, how likely each company will be, uh, will be prosecuted for money laundering and shell company the next quarter. And they, they were really successful. Uh, and we initially didn't know who was the proposer, and uh, during the three months of incubation, on the second month, they say we predict that this company will be sued, uh, persecuted in within the next quarter. And when we're on the quarterfinal and the finals, the company actually gets persecuted. Uh, and so it's a really good prediction model, I guess. Uh, but it also must answer a lot of questions about how do we do federated deep learning in individual different uh, sectors, different data controllers without exposing any raw data for people who are actually not committing any crimes. And of course, we know how to do it mathematically. There is split learning. There is open algorithm. We invited the open algorithm team to Taiwan to uh, share this kind of art. But we really need to translate it into regulations that each ministry can understand. And we're still in the process of doing so. But the presidential trophy really helps to further this process. So I don't think we will regret it, even though it will require a lot of imagination uh, in terms of political political um, economy and technological allocations. Which SDG is the most overrated <laughs> and which is the most underrated? I'll answer that as my last question. Uh, <laughs> QF. Yes, um, I, I really like QF, and we are actually doing a lot of matching funds uh, from the uh, National Fund of Taiwan. Uh, it is doing a matching fund 50% to 50% to the NGO um, funding coalition. So I'm actually really looking to combine that to another blockchain-based crowdfunding uh, platform in Taiwan called Duduker. And if we can uh, merge those two together somehow or interface them somehow, um, because they are doing kind of two or quadratic funding already, uh, from both ends of the tunnel, uh, there is a real chance of really making it happen. How is digital literacy in Taiwan? How inclusive is this? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we take broadband as a human right. That's the promise from our president. And so in the other rural, indigenous, and remote areas, we have 98% broadband coverage, meaning that everybody have 10 megabits per second or higher uh, in 15 euros per month or lower uh, and for unlimited 4G connection. And if you don't have have connectivity, it's my fault, you can talk to me. And there is already uh, the number that shows the remaining 2% are almost always uh, above 3,000 meters. Now the logical thing to uh, do that is to wait until 6G and satellite connection, but we are, you know, fanatical commitment in this. So actually the Minister of Interior just last month said that he will use the practicing drill of the helicopters when they are not rescuing people from disasters to help setting up the final repeater and telecom towers for the remaining 2%. And that is the kind of commitment Taiwan does. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we bring those tech to where people are already meeting in their town halls. We're not asking people to use their phones. We're bringing these technologies to people to amplify, to listen to their voices, and use police and other technologies to capture those voices into things of national uh, importance and have people vote on it. Finally, uh, which SDG is most overrated? I don't think there's any SDG that is overrated. If there is one, it will be broken down into two SDGs during the uh, UN bureaucratic process. UNDP is very good at that. And what is uh, the most underrated? Well, I think the, the SDG 17 uh, is very underrated. People usually see 17 and see it as the most abstract one, because if you look at SDG through its numbering, it starts with something very tangible, ending poverty, 
uh, ending hunger, um, health, education, who, who can be uh, against those? And it gets more and more abstract. And finally, the 17th partnership for the goals, uh, which is very abstract. And usually by that time, if you read linearly, uh, you, you don't really know what the 17th is talking about anyway. Uh, and so I think it's very underrated. So when we draw the SDGs, we draw a Venn diagram showing how the triple bottom line can reinforce each other, the social environment and economy, and put 17 in the middle. Because it's only through digital means, or maybe in the future quantum means, but now only with digital means can we actually <laughs> have the different sectors who operate under vastly different logic to see how exactly it, they can reinforce each other's missions. And so uh, my work as digital minister is described very aptly with three particular targets within SDG 17. It is 17, 18, enhancing availability of reliable data across sectors using distributed ledgers and so on. 17, 17, encouraging effective partnerships, as with presidential hackathon, but also internationally. And also 17.6, that is open innovation. For example, the water savior team that saves water gets invited to Wellington for three months after the presidential hackathon to co-create the AI that will also fix the water shortage problem, water leak problem for the Wellington Water Company. And we are always open for innovation in this way for co-creation instead of in a more kind of techno-colonizing way. So that actually is my job description three years ago. When the HR asked me to write, I just wrote three, uh, you know, pairs of numbers, and they're like, nobody know what you're talking about, Minister. <laughs> you have to write something uh, in plain text. And so I wrote a, a small poem, and that is my job description, and I will read it to you now um, as the answer to a final question. And it goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it the Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you.